Uh, hello everyone and welcome to the webinar, Planting Trees and Carbon Footprint Calculator in Your Classroom. This event is part of the Terra Mission MOOCRE Run, Teaching Sustainability for Action. My name is Mihalina Partega, and together with my colleague Miriam Molina, we would like to thank you for joining us. Before I pass the floor to our speakers, I would like to cover a few housekeeping, housekeeping topics. First, please make sure your sound is turned, turned uh, on. We would like to remind you that during this webinar, your cameras and microphones are off. Secondly, if you have any questions, you are invited to write them here in the chat and we will address them in the end. The webinar is recorded and we'll publish it in the course. So later you can watch it again if you wish. You will also have access to all the slides and links shared during this webinar. And now I would like to welcome our speakers. Uh, today with us, we have Aroa Gregori and Crystal Moore. Aroa is the education team coordinator at the Life Terra Foundation, and she will tell you all about tree planting and how to involve your students in it. Crystal is a predoctoral researcher at the University of Barcelona, and she will explain how to interpret the results from the Life Terra carbon footprint calculator and also how to bring it to your classroom. And now, without any further ado, I would like to first pass the floor to Ado Aroa. Enjoy. Hi, good afternoon to everyone. I'm Aroa, and I'm going to talk to you about how to plant trees at school with your pupils. So um, just uh, for you to know, I will give first a brief summary about what Life Terra is. And then please have your phones close to you because we will do a small practice, a small exercise together to actually learn how the Life Terra platform works and how you can then tag trees. We will see what that means later. So um, at this point, I guess all of you already know a bit about what Life Terra is, but just to have a recap or an overview, I, I will say that Life Terra is a foundation with the mission to restore our connection with the earth. And we seek to enable people to take impactful climate action now. And this includes you teachers and educators. To do this, we facilitate tree planting, educate future generations, and we also work to develop tree monitoring technology. Our ultimate goal is to plant 500 million trees in Europe. That's a symbol because we are 500 million people living in, in Europe, so it means that every one of us can at least plant one tree. So to date, uh, in 2022 indeed, because we keep uh, updating our data every, every day almost, we have planted more than one million trees together. Also together with our planting partners and many other partners like schools, companies, other NGOs, entities, associations, governments, and so on. So we have gathered all that people and stakeholders to plant more than 4, four million trees to date in more than 17, 18 countries. As I said, the, the number keeps growing. So this is just an, an example, but uh, at this point is many are many more. So why plant trees? Why we do that? So plant trees is the most um, cost effective, we could say, um, action for, for, for the climate. Planting 500 billion trees globally also could remove 25% of the existing carbon in the atmosphere. And we have proof that there are big areas available in Europe for, for reforestation for these actions. It requires, let's say, uh, limited political buy-in or commitments. And mm, it can be done also almost by everyone or yeah, by everyone and at any time. So we would like to highlight that planting trees is a fantastic small action that has a great, great power to educate not only kids or small kids, but all generations. So that's why actually we, we do it. So our success, so we are planting trees and doing and starting this great project from 2020s, but our success is partly thanks of you, teachers and educators and the schools that joined our, our dream almost, our, our plan. And to date we have more than 600 schools on board that already planted trees with us in many different 
countries and even even beyond Europe. So why you should plant trees with your with your kids? We, we believe that planting trees with us in this case um, will allow you to engage your pupils in direct climate action. So in a real action that they can do with their own hands. It also develops uh, digital skills because now you will see how we tag everything, every tree we plant. So we really keep registry of every every action we do. And this is also very educative for, for people learning and young people. It also uh, has the um, opportunity to, to make the relationships at the school stronger because you will be working together in a, in a one single project. And of course, reduce the footprint, the carbon footprint that we will see better later with our colleague Crystal, what that means. It creates definitely a, a positive impact in local communities. And as I said, is a tangible and a relevant action we can do for, to take a positive impact in terms of climate crisis and climate change. It contributes, of course, as well to the sustainable development goals. So the famous SDGs that I'm sure you all know. And it gives you the opportunity to take direct part in a in a European project, in an EU project founded, um, co-founded by the by the European Commission directly. And in the end, of course, it, you will be participating in a unique movement to try to make our planet planet a green, a greener place. So how you can join us at this point, you are already in. <laughs> so what you can do is after this MOOC, try to mm, use the Terra mission package you are now exploring and teach sustainability. We don't talk only about trees, as you know, but of many different topics regarding sustainability. You can also, after this um, MOOC, after teaching, after looking at these topics with kids in the classroom, go outside and plant trees with them, actually. For this, um, later on, we will share with you a guide, a uh, step-by-step -step guide on how you can do all the steps you need in, from finding the land to choosing the right species to organize the, the activity and so on. So we will accompany you with this process. And then what we are going to, to check now is to how to tag your, your trees with Life Terra because it's not the same uh, to plant them and then no one knows and even you maybe don't know after some years where the trees are, but what we try to do is the opposite. So not only plant the trees, but then tag them, register them in an online platform and get a map to all of all the trees we have planted together. So that's what we are going to practice now together. If you are ready um so please take your uh, your phone next to you and scan this qr code in which we have prepared a small demo so that we can see together how this amazing platform works and how you can actually tag the trees you plant with your kids in this case I, i'm giving you some time but please try to to scan the code as soon as possible so then i will move to to my to my computer and we will see uh, the step-by-step -step process okay so as i was saying now together we will tag uh, so we will register a fake tree of course because probably you like me are sit down sat down in a in a table in an office so that's okay um but we will try to do the whole process so that we can see at least how it works. And then once you get ready for the for, for the, the real planting, you will know already how, how to use this platform. OK, so at this point, probably you have found this. Um, the first thing that this plus platform will ask you is to, to put your email. So you will need to enter your email here in the first step and then once you have pressed on submit on the submit number you will get a code a special code in your email so you will need to go to your email account open your email account and then you will see a new email from life terra that says your code is here so you would need to enter the code in here in the second uh, screen you will see and press on submit and once you do that I'm going to share this one. Now I guess you can see my screen.
Yeah. Okay, so I hope you are on board. If not, if you couldn't manage with your phone, don't worry because you will see here in the screen all the steps and then you will be able to do it later on with your phone. Okay, so once you put your email, you submit it and you also in input your code and submit again, you will be welcomed to this um, fake event we have prepared for today, but this is actually the real screen you will get once you are in the field ready to plant trees with your pupils. So the first three thing we need to do is to start with tagging a tree. It might appear an extra um, screen asking you to allow the location in your phone. In this case, since I'm doing it in the laptop, it doesn't show, but you just need to allow the system or the platform to know your location because we will see that is very precise and we try to get the exact place where your tree or your trees are planted. If I press the, the, uh, the first button, tag a tree, it means let's start. And the first thing it will ask me is to take a picture of my tree. So here you can, in your phone, take a picture and it, you, it will go directly to your camera. But now what we're going to do is to input uh, also a fake picture just for the sake of the, of the demo. So we will go to next. In our phone, it will show uh, buttons that says next and the next step after the picture that we will have to um, take above from the tree so that we can look at it and be really really close to it not not just from far away but remember we want the exact location so the next thing we have to do is to choose which species we have to we, we have just planted in this case we have three examples and we have also another example you will find always available that says unknown species in the case you don't know which tree it is but of course i we assume this is a whole uh, preparation we have to do before the planting so for sure you will know which species is at that point so let's choose just an example we have the name in latin or in the scientific name and then also in english so we will choose which species is and then press next and that's it. Super easy. What we have now is our whole oak. And what we can do now if we plant more than one tree is to go again, tag another tree. And again, it will ask us for the um, location, for the picture we have to take from above, and then the species. And once we have the picture and the species, it, we will get here a longer list with more trees. In the end, in very important step what we have to do is to press this button upload all the trees so once we press there we give it a couple of seconds and hooray you have saved all your trees okay and what happens here since once that we have tagged the tree let's check if we have done it well i'm going to refresh this page i will explain you what it is yay we have seven people already tagging trees so this is the dashboard we have prepared for you in this case for this today's webinar okay in case you plant trees with your own school you will have your own dashboard where you will you will see the name of the event that you will choose you will explain you how this will be the name or the logo of your school and then we will have you see we have someone from turkey someone now new in portugal someone in Barcelona as well, in Serbia. You see, this is all of us planting trees. If I, maybe if I refresh, we find more. Yes, yeah, so we have a few trees already tagged, and this is what you will get when you decide to organize a, a planting event with your, with your pupils. So you will get uh, these uh, points in your, in your platform. And apart from that, you will also get uh, an event in our own web page in Life Terra in the events section. You will get your own event where it also says how many trees we have planted. This says one because of the demo, how many people participated. You can upload some pictures of your activity and you will get there a small uh, overview, a small briefing or explanation about the, the event. And in the end, you can also see the, the plot where the trees were planted. So the, the planting area, you will have all this available for, for your school. And yeah, just to reminder in our, in our website, how you can log in to your, 
to your account that you have just done in your phone, you can do it also here with the login and sign up uh, button. And finally, what you will get is uh, the number of trees you planted yourself or of course your school. In my case is 162 and then all together we have planted, as I said before, more than 4,000, uh, sorry, 4 million trees in Europe. So you will be able to see all those trees planted by all teachers and other entities around and check them and look into the details. So I don't want to, to use more of your time. Thank you for participating in this in this in this small test. Um, as I said before, we will share with you after the MOOC and at the end of the MOOC, sorry, a guide on how to do all this process step by step. I hope you enjoyed and you are looking to plant trees together with us. So thank you all for your attention and see you soon. If you have any questions to the speaker, just pose them in a chat. We'll address them at the end. Okay, thanks so much for that, Aroa. I'm sure everyone is very inspired to start planting trees now. Um, hi everyone, I'm Crystal. I'm working with the University of Barcelona. I'm doing my um, PhD with them. So part of my PhD is on the carbon footprint calculator, which we're working with LifeTerra on. Okay, so we're going to go through the carbon footprint calculator and how you can apply it in your classroom. Okay, so first I'll start with a small introduction to the global climate emergency. Starting with, of course, the greenhouse gas effect. So basically the sun produces solar radiation, which goes through the Earth's atmosphere. Some of that radiation is absorbed by the Earth. It becomes heat. Some of that is then released back out into space. Now this is under a normal scenario. So in our atmosphere, we have greenhouse gases that are naturally there. So with a normal level of greenhouse gases, that radiation can escape, that heat escapes. However, with the human enhanced greenhouse gas effect that we are living in currently, we have significantly more greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. So because of that, the radiation, the heat is getting trapped and is unable to exit. So effectively, that has led to increased global temperatures. OK, so how did we get here? Well, of course, this all started with the Industrial Revolution in the 18th to 19th century. So the Industrial Revolution, of course, refers to a period in time which, which featured huge technological, socioeconomic and cultural change, the most significant of which was probably the use of new energy sources. So, of course, we're talking about fuels, coal, steam engines, electricity, and petroleum. So fast forward to today in the 20th, well, 21st century, but fast forward to the 20th, 21st century, and we have seen the increased rise of industrialization. So we are now living in a supply and demand market. That of course means that there's an increased demand for electricity, there are mining booms, so we have offshore oil drilling, um, huge mining um, extractions. Um, with consumerism, there's a lot more production of, of textiles, of goods, of services. The invention of the car, the automobile, obviously a huge rise in petroleum once cars became widely available. Industrial farming um, and of course, overpopulation. So we're seeing a huge increase in the use of electricity. So why is the increased use of energy a bad thing? Well, to be honest, it's mostly because we're using non-renewable energy sources and we're using carbon intensive energy sources. So you can see on this um, little graph here, so of all things that produce greenhouse gases, 
energy produces 73.2% of those greenhouse gases. So that's almost two thirds of all greenhouse gas emissions. Of that 73%, 98% of those emissions come from the burning of fossil fuels. So if we were to change to more sustainable energy sources, we could dramatically lower that number. Okay, so this picture demonstrates that it's not, the climate emergency is not all about energy use and increased production. It actually affects every single aspect of our lives. So of course, the global climate emergency has led to habitat and biodiversity loss. Oops, sorry. Habitat and biodiversity loss, water shortages, global temperatures rising, sea levels rising, and all of that impacts us not only as a collective, but on an individual level as well. So it impacts our health, it impacts our well-being, um, it even impacts our health systems. So it really touches every single aspect of our lives. Okay, so there is a need to keep global temperatures under two degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial levels. So at the moment with our current policies, we're on track to reach 2.8 degrees Celsius of an increase um, by the end of this century. So 2% is widely regarded as the absolute most that we can reach before we see catastrophic impacts. So we really need to keep it under that. Since we're on track to exceed that, we really need to take strong action soon to make sure that we're not going over that two degree warming. Okay, so here I have a little example of what that means. So this example is related to species, but you can basically see the species loss depending on what degree of global warming we achieve. So if we do stick to two degrees above pre-industrial levels, we're sitting at around five to 20% habitat loss globally. If we go all the way up to four degrees Celsius, we're really looking at 80 to 100% globally, particularly around the equator. So you can see how with each degree, it becomes more and more alarming and it becomes more and more um, intense. And this is just species loss, but of course that affects our food production and it affects everything. Okay, that said, <laughs> we can still change those projections. So we're not doomed, we have time, we can change that um, projection, but we do need to act quickly. So how do we reduce emissions quickly? Well, frankly, we need to put pressure on governments, industries and universities to make structural and social change. So we can put pressure on them to invest in green initiatives, to invest in research and development, to distribute profits to um, NGOs, to organisations that are helping address the um, global climate emergency. And perhaps most importantly, is education. We can invest in education and we can support education. <clears throat> I put this quote here as well from one of the seminal papers that I'm using. So the relationship between everyday behavior, carbon emissions and global climate change lies at the core of understanding and addressing climate change. So basically understanding our actions, understanding our global emissions is the core of addressing climate change. On that note, um, people often ask me, why, uh, why so much focus on the individual? Why are we looking at individual carbon emissions? You know, we know that, um, that corporations emit so much, why the individual? And the answer is yes, corporations emit way more than a single individual. But I also think that people underestimate their own power and they underestimate the power of the collective. So people as a collective have the power to influence governments and governments influence um, industry. People can also influence industry with their shopping habits. And we can also influence government with our voting habits. So frankly, it's a big circle, it's all connected. And I think we have a lot more power than we give ourselves credit for. Okay, so what is a carbon footprint? So quite simply, the carbon footprint is the sum of greenhouse gas emissions produced to develop a product, service or activity. 
So for example, a car has a, a carbon footprint um, and that is all the greenhouse gases used in the production, in the annual running costs until its life ends basically. So in the case of an individual, it is the greenhouse gas emissions that we produce every year. And why is the carbon footprint important? Well, it helps us understand the weight of the different consumption choices that we make based on greenhouse gas emissions. So for example, if we all know what our choices emit in terms of greenhouse gases, we can make more sustainable choices. So on this graph here, you can see that per kilogram of tofu, it produces three kilograms of greenhouse gases. Compared to beef, for example, which if you want to include the methane, which is the gases produced by the cows, um, it can produce up to 100 kilograms of carbon per kilogram of product. So if we know these things, we're more able to make sustainable choices. Maybe we can eat slightly less meat. Maybe we can opt for tofu. Maybe we can go for fish. We can see fish is a lot lower as well. Um, but knowing the impact of these things is the core to changing them. Okay, so why a carbon footprint calculator? Well, um, in order to change behaviours, people need three factors to be present. They need to be capable, they need to be motivated, and they must have opportunities presented to them to engage in behaviour change. So the carbon footprint calculator is simply one tool of providing those three factors. Okay. So the life terror calculator that um, so many of you filled in prior to this, to this workshop, um, how did we create it? So we had, to, we had to do a few things. We had to make assumptions. We had to ask simple questions to collect maximum data. And what that means is you would have noticed that when we asked about your diet, we asked, do you eat a lot of meat? Do you eat meat every day? Or do you never eat meat? For example, what we could have done to get an absolutely perfect calculation is to ask you, what is every single thing that you eat from the time that you wake up until the time that you go to sleep for an entire year? That's not feasible. <laughs> That's not possible for us. It's not possible for you. Um, I think people would see that question and they would click out of it. So <laughs> basically, we've had to make some assumptions we've had to simplify the questions to collect the most data possible. So it's a delicate balance between scientific robustness, feasibility in terms of research and design, and of course, accessibility for our users. The structure of the Life Terror Calculator is mostly in five parts. So we have transport, diet, household, shopping, and then of course, your consumption habits. Um, the reason that we have these particular categories is because these are the most carbon intensive categories. Okay, so how did we create it? Um, basically, we found, we scoured the internet for every carbon footprint calculator available. We analysed 108 calculators. We did a literature review as well. And then we found the best of the best. And we assessed nine in theory. We assessed five with live audiences. And then we used all of that information to develop the calculator that you have seen and used for this workshop. So now we have about 200 responses in the Life Terror Calculator um, after running two workshops in six workshops, sorry, in two countries. Okay, so what are the aims of this workshop, of getting you to do the carbon footprint calculator and then discussing your results? Number one is education. So we want to strengthen our understanding of climate change mitigation efforts and the impact of our daily activities. We want to empower people by deepening our understanding of how to advocate for structural and individual change. And then lastly, we want behaviour change. We want to help people change their behaviours by equipping ourselves with the tools to understand and change individual business and government behaviours. Okay, so now the fun part. <laughs> um, so yes, thank you so much to everyone who filled out, who took the time to fill out the Life Terror Calculator prior to this workshop and who then inputted their responses into the Google Forms. So 
This um, graph that you can see is that's a, um, a representation of the average carbon footprint of everyone who filled that out. So there were about 120 respondents. So this is a really good indication of what everyone's average carbon footprint is. So the total average of this cohort is about 7.7 .7 tonnes of carbon, di of carbon dioxide equivalents. The global average is about 7.4 tonnes. So we're very close to the global average, which means, uh, well, I think that means that this is a good representation of, of everyone's climate change, um, carbon footprint, sorry. Um, the average EU27 carbon footprint is about 9.5 tonnes. So we are doing better than the EU average um, and then just slightly more above the global average. So what I like to do here when talking about, sorry, <clears throat> when talking about people's carbon footprints, I like to go by category. So in this cohort of everyone who filled out the carbon footprint calculator, we can see that the top category for emissions is diet. Now, that may be because we have a lot of meat eaters that filled out the calculator. Um, it may be just because we don't have many people that take pub, um, that use transport very often. And the reason I say that is because most of the time transport is actually the highest category. So it's really interesting to see that in this cohort, transport is not very high. So maybe that means we don't have many international flyers. Maybe people are already doing a lot in terms of taking the bike instead of the car. Um, and that wouldn't surprise me because I'm sure we have um, some really ecologically minded people in this group. So maybe you're already doing everything that you can in the transport section. Um, household is the second highest category. That's not surprising, to be honest. Household is usually quite high up there because, of course, energy use, um, energy use in the household, um, that's usually a pretty high category. Now, what can we do to reduce our, our emissions in these categories? As I said before, with transport, of course, we can take our bikes. If we have a bike, we can walk more often. We can opt for public transport instead of cars. Um, and of course, these are just where these options are available. Of course, if you live rurally, you might not have an option but to take the car. But on those chances when you do, um, you can opt for more sustainable options. With our diet, you can opt for a few days of, um, of no meat per week. Um, some people choose to go entirely vegan. Of course, that's the best thing that you can do for the environment. Um, but even just cutting meat out a little bit is, um, is very helpful. With our household, um, it's quite, I think, apparent, you know, turning off lights when we're not using them, um, put using blankets instead of heating if we have the option to do that. Um, there are many ways that we can reduce um, electricity around the household. We can also buy, when we buy white goods, we can buy more sustainable, more energy efficient ones. <coughs> Sorry. Okay. Goods and commercial services is quite low. Um, so that's good. I think that's a good result. So that's not many people eating out, um, not many people going to bars and hotels and all of that. Okay, now with the public services, um, I some of you may have some questions about public services. The reason that we chose to include that category is because it is an undeniable carbon footprint. We all use roads, we all use hospitals, um, and so we all basically have an equal carbon footprint in public services. And we thought that it would be remiss of us to not include that because we're simply just not including a really major category of something that we all use. Okay, so now that we've looked at the carbon footprint calculator, how can we apply it in our classroom? So as an activity, you can do it in a similar way to what we've done here. You can do it as a one-off in the classroom get the children to fill out, get the pupils, sorry, to fill out the carbon footprint calculator and then go through the individual or collective results. You can also do it as a recurring activity. So how does our carbon footprint change from winter to summer, for example? You can relate it to your classroom. So how do the categories relate to lessons that we've had in class? We can also relate their footprint to items that they use heavily. So for example, iPhones, consoles, school uniforms. 
And lastly, we can also ask students to investigate further. So we can compare items. For example, what is the carbon footprint of an Xbox compared with a PlayStation? What is a Samsung phone compared to an iPhone? Um, we can also explore what other ways we produce carbon footprints. So, you know, cloud storage, email attachments, all the other sort of hidden ways that we produce a carbon footprint. And we can also talk about some effective ways to reduce or offset our carbon footprint individually. Okay, that's all for me. Thank you. And I will pass over for questions. Thank you very much, Crystal. So, um... I guess now we'll address some questions from that were in the MOOC itself. Um, so, well, first let me start with um, maybe um, maybe a more question about um, the carbon footprint calculator as we just talked about it. Um, so there are many questions of how to apply the carbon footprint calculator in spe for specific subjects, for example, for physics, for math, for history, and maybe you could uh, give us some examples uh, how to apply it to a specific subject. Yeah, of course. Um, so with maths, I think this is a really data intensive exercise. So to create um, the graph that I showed you before, there were, I think, 120 inputs. So you can also look at statistics from that. Um, you can look at different ways of representing that data. I think maths is a really good subject to include that in. Um, and in history as well, you mentioned, I think we could possibly look at, um, you know, pre-industrial revolution to now and look at how individual carbon footprint, carbon footprints would have changed um, over time. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, and now, Aroa, maybe um, you could tell us... Um, about uh, planting in the um, specific regions of the world. So we have many questions, for example, about um, how how can teachers get information, uh, what to look for if they plant in Turkey or if they plant in Romania, for example. Yes, that's a very nice question. And also, um, I would like to highlight that what we try to do at Life Terra, and it's actually our motto, is to plant the right tree in the right place. So what, that, what does it mean? We always uh, study and analyze well which species we should plant, especially because we usually don't plant in gardens with exotic species and so on and more decorative or ornamental um, function. But instead, what we do is to focus on reforestation and restoring the land. So for that, of course, we'll, we always need to, to study well which tree we should select. For our big projects, we have our colleagues here, including Crystal from the University of Barcelona, that help us to make a, a deep study on the right species. But for uh, small scale projects, we also have a tool that helps you to choose the species. This tool is included in our guideline that we will share very soon with you. So you will have um, a comprehensive guide on how, how to go step by step in your tree planting event because of course as you may know it's not only the day of the event but it needs a lot of preparation choosing the trees uh, getting the trees doing the day so you you will have there uh, the tool where it's a sort of a map it's very easy to use for uh, for anyone and you just um, type your location and you will get get there sorry um, a list of um, tentative species you could use. But of course, then we always recommend to consult with the local experts because we cannot know all the specific regions in, in Europe and beyond where we plan, but we always work hand in, to, hand in hand with the local experts and biologists and nurseries that help us to choose the perfect species for every place. So thank you for your question. Very good one. Thank you very much, Ara. Um, so now, Crystal, could you tell us uh, where, so teachers are asking where we can find the link to the carbon uh, footprint calculator that you use? Yeah, of course. So it is available on the Life Terra website, um, but I can also share it with you so that maybe we can pop it in the chat or you can distribute it to the teachers at the end as well. Perfect. I think it's also mm -hmm. in the MOOC itself. So, uh, mm. so that's where that's the the the, the carbon footprint calculator that we were talking about. Um, so now, Aroa. Mm, so there are also some questions about um, personal benefits from planting trees. 
Um, so how could you um, benefit personally from yeah, participating in such an event or just planting yourself? Wow, <laughs> that's an interesting question. So, I mean, you just need to go for it and you will discover the, the benefits, how, how good you feel after that. Usually we stop uh, at the desk and we stop with all the theory and yes, maybe we go recycle, but it's very difficult to see the results of our actions. But when you really get outside and get your hands dirty, sometimes even under the rain or under any condition you, you would imagine, and you do plant a tree, it's like really planting a seed in yourself as well. Like this is the experience we, we get always when we go plant with people, with adults, but you have to see with kids how amazing is the impact they have. Like it really changes their, I don't know, their, their, they really feel empowered to do, uh, to, to take real action, you know, not just to study how we can do, how can I uh, do things at home, which are also very important, but with trees, there is something special because trees are alive and uh, I think it really creates a connection with you. So <laughs> I think maybe it's a bit spiritual <laughs> what I am what I am saying, but I think that's actually the main benefit you get personally. If then you're working with with kids, you will see also how how this this has a great impact on your your well-being and your yeah, feeling good and wanting to not only plan, but we, because we say, Planting is only the first step. It's like having a baby. It's not just uh, having it, but then it really, it's really where it all starts and you have to look after and check. And that's why you have this app because then you will be able to re re remember about your tree in your phone and check the picture and you have the location there. So you can always go back to that place and not forget where it was. So yeah, many benefits, I would say. Thank you very much. It's true. It has so many benefits. And I guess first step is just to try and see for yourself. Um, so now I guess I have a question sort of for both of you. And it's about how um, how can we engage more teachers in these kind of activities? So maybe first let's go with the carbon footprint calculator. Um, so Crystal, mm -hmm. the floor is yours. Yeah, what a good question. So how can we involve more educators? I mean, I would love to know the answer to that. <laughs> no, of course. I mean, of course, we can distribute it. Um, we can share what we've learned in the workshop today. Um, and I think a really important thing is to just let teachers know that these tools exist. I think that, you know, there are so many things online. Um, there are so many resources that sometimes things can get can sort of fall through the cracks. But if we're able to share these resources amongst each other, um, you know, distribute the life terror materials, uh, once people are made aware that they're there and they're made aware of how easy they are to use, I think they're really empowered to use them. I can maybe also mm -hmm. try to respond. I, and I liked a lot the comment uh, just appeared there by Marty. Uh, make it a school campaign. <laughs> so yeah, that's the, the best option. Just um, talk to each other. The, the word of mouth between teachers, you have actually more power than we have actually because you you know other teacher teachers better than us. And what works best always is to um, do what you know that it worked for others, for your colleagues. So we have many schools that already um tried and planted and they are very happy but it's hard for us to share these these is these stories for you so the best thing is you talk to your colleagues you try to make it a project because planting is not as i said not something that you do for one day but it is for life you can do it every time during the planting season like not in the hot summer but because everything is explained in the guide about all these uh details you need to consider for the, for tree planting but yeah, I mean, you can do it every year, for example, or for every uh, group of kids that leave the school or that start in the school. And if you keep, you give continuity to this project, that's how you see the results, because then you see the trees growing and you can also estimate or analyze them, the tree mortality, for example, or the tree um, su survival, because of course, with like in any project, some trees will not make it. That's nature. It's okay. But this is how you can really monitor your action and it, 
included in many different subjects to 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 make it a a, a global project for the whole school and for for years. So yeah, definitely word of mouth, I would say, and engage others and share if you like it, even the program. The Terra mission, you know, it's not only about trees, it's about many different things about sustainability. If it worked, if it was these materials were useful for you, you can always share them and explain your, your examples and tell us your story, story so we can share it with more people. Exactly, and uh, also come to these kind of events and uh, probably pass the information that they are happening. Um, so, Ara, maybe uh, you can also um, tell us if um, during a tree planting activity, we have to tuck each tree or an average tree or just a representative number of them? Yeah, we do it for every single tree. <laughs> that's, a, that's a hard work. So as I was saying before, when we work at a very large scale to plant thousands and thousands of trees, we do this task um, in the back end, let's say. So we, together with experts, we do it with the with monitoring platforms in the computer, in the table and so on. So to, to really have control of every tree, single tree planted. But in this case is that when we do something participatory with people, citizens, not only schools, huh? this applies for many different groups of people that come to plant with us and we give them all of them the tagging tool so that each of them can plant the trees they, they planted. So in the end, you have to monitor one to five to 10 to 20, it depends on you, but there are not so many trees so you can really, really manage. And for teenagers, especially, I would like to mention that they really love the app more than planting itself. So they are want to use the, the phone. So yeah, they are, they are happy to support teachers in uh, in that case. But so yeah, we, we really monitor every single tree. If you go into the, the platform in the logging, you, we have just tried together. You can see and you can zoom in in every single tree and you will see the, the map uh, locator there and you can go inside and you will see the photo of the tree. You will see which date it was planted, which species, in which event it was planted. So we have information for yeah for everything. That's why actually the, the European Commission helped us to because they really want to know every single tree that is being planted in Europe in the in the coming years. Perfect. Thank you very much. Then yeah, we'll make sure that every single tree is uh, in the app. Uh, and now, Crystal, maybe you can address this question. So, do you see some ways to include global warming in mathematics lesson? I think that's a really good question. And I think um, it's kind of similar to, I'm going to give a similar answer to the one I gave before about including the carbon footprint calculator in a maths class. I think that um, there is so much science behind environmental science and climate change science, and it's not as simple as just ecology or um, zoology, you know. it's There is so much maths-heavy <laughs> science behind all of this, and I think that definitely when addressing challenges as, as big as climate change, there, yeah, there are so many avenues that you can go down. So you can look at um, climate projections, for example. They are based heavily on historical data. Um, so historical data and then making projections into the future based on that. Um, yeah, so there is so much maths involved <laughs> in, in all of this. So again, you can look at statistics with things like the carbon footprint calculator. Um, global warming, you can look at um, historical climate projections, you can even look at things like um, uh, water temperature, you know, it's all, it, there's so much data um, in every single aspect of, of climate change and, and data is always, um, yeah, very related to maths, so there's a lot. <laughs> Perfect, thank you very much. Um, and Ara, could you tell us um, maybe some ideas on how to incorporate Life Terra project in English class? Well, thanks for for this question. I think it's a it's a very good one. As you probably know, these materials, the Terra mission materials, are available in seven different languages. 
but we have so many more languages in Europe and in the world that are not included, unfortunately, in the in our package yet. That you can use them uh, for your English uh, for your English uh, lectures in for, for kids. I mean, there are, as Crystal said, there, there are so many things that you can explore about sustainability. That, for example, the vocabulary about uh, specific topics like we have, for example, a whole topic in agriculture. So there you can explore so many new words depending on your level, uh, the level of, of the of the pupils. And also, as you know, the, the trees, but we also have about oceans and water in general in the world. So there are also so many uh, wor new words you can you can explore there in the as Crystal said, with all the global warming and climate change. Uh, topics that are so I mean kids already know because <laughs> I, I tried it and it's not like when we were studying but now it's a it's a really hot topic everyone mm, knows about it at, the, at, at least have heard about it so it's very nice to start making kids familiar with this with these terms yeah so yeah I think for vocabulary is very is very good and then even with the videos many videos are in native and I mean in English you cannot translated, but then you can use the subtitles. So this is also really powerful to start having kids listening to, to English, how it is being explained and then read it. And of course, I mean, all the materials are very, very nice for, for English lessons. Perfect. I think it's also to have some glossaries. It's really good idea. Um, so maybe now there is also a question about um, planting local flowers instead of trees. So did you ever thought about um, planting local flowers to increase biodiversity, for example? Yeah, good question. Thank you for that. So in this case, um, the, the Life Terra project, because it's um, we, we cannot forget it's a European project, so we got some funds to do very specific actions. So these actions of our planting actions are focused on the trees and also shrubs, so big shrubs, let's say above um, 0.5 meters or, or so. So this is the specific sector of trees and the shrubs we focus on. But it doesn't mean we don't allow allow other species to be present in in our platform because in the end, what we want is to really uh, empower everyone and give the opportunity to everyone to plant trees. And we understand, especially for schools, it already happens to us that with kids um, you cannot plant very big trees. We actually go always for small seedlings or garden species that are maybe even aromatics or this kind of species. In that case, we allow everyone to do it. That's not a problem. You just need to register. You will, you will see how in the guide, because now I don't want to, to bore you, but um, you will see it in the guide. You just need to type the species that we still don't know because it's very local or you don't find it in our list. So you just type it and you will be able to register this species in our in our platform. Then in the back end, we will make sure these flowers are not counted as trees because of the calculations we do also for the carbon uh, emissions so that the university can have the calculations in place without flowers, but yes, for sure. Like in this case, these actions um, in your case are more focused on education and uh, to educate, you just need the action of planting, you know, you know. Yes, I guess going outdoors is always uh, very motivating for students and they enjoy it a lot. They love um, it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so maybe uh, there is also a question if um, there is any app or website, I guess, that tells you uh, the name of the tree that you planted. So does anyone know anything about that? Yeah, I can give a tip here. Uh, also in our guide, because we try to support you in every step. Um, there are a few uh, apps like PlantNet, iNaturalist and a couple of more. We have the links in there so that in case you don't have any expert around, let's say, you can always with this app just take a picture of the leaf or of any part of the of the plant and it will help you to know the, the name. But as I said before, we always recommend to check with experts, even locally, even the biology teacher, maybe he already or she already knows um, which species are, are more appropriate for the for the local place or the nursery. But yeah, of course, we always have this digital uh, support for the species selection. 
Um, okay, now we also have a um, topic of, you know, that, that, that sort of um, the climate change is going to affect mostly the younger generations. Um, so, well, maybe there are some really good ways of introducing that topic to preschool. Uh, maybe, Crystal, do you see some way of, of getting uh, the climate awareness to, to them, to the preschool? Students. Yeah, definitely. So we actually do have some life terror materials called Terror Mission and they're aimed at primary school students. So they're interactive, they're very easy to incorporate in the classroom um, and you can also modify them to suit your needs as well. So we have lots of different topics on there from agriculture, water, energy um, and many more. So that's a really good way to introduce students um, to the topic. And we also, we have some interactive activities and some suggestions for activities outside of the classroom as well. So I'd probably suggest starting there. Perfect, thank you very much. Um, I think we're slowly getting close to the end uh, of our session. So on my side, I would like to thank you all for joining. Uh, and also thank you to Crystal and Aroa for uh, explaining everything in such a detail. Um, and yes, I hope uh, you enjoyed the event. And uh, if you have any more questions, also feel free to contact us. Uh, and we also hope that uh, maybe some of the questions will be answered within the MOOC. Because, for example, the ones about trees or the species, uh, you will also get the guide in the MOOC itself. Um, so, um, thank you all for joining. And um, And uh, I think that's all from my side. So enjoy your uh, Friday evening. Thank you very much for being here. It was a pleasure. And thanks, Michalina and Miriam and the UN for inviting us. Yes, thank you, everyone.